Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the annual Memorial Arthur L. Johnson event series. In 1950, a remarkable young man, Arthur L. Johnson, came to our hometown of Detroit, Michigan. He saw tremendous potential for this city, and for six decades, he worked tirelessly as a civil rights leader, ardent arts advocate, and a visionary who was most passionately devoted to our Detroit community. In November 2001, Detroiters paid respects as Arthur was laid to rest. As we have moved forward, his legend lives on within each one of us. Arthur's contributions to Detroit, Michigan, and the nation include his work as Wayne State University's first director of community relations, as president of Detroit's NAACP branch, and as a champion behind key artistic initiatives in his beloved city, including the Detroit Symphony's legendary Classical Roots series. Arthur stood for everything that we hope to inspire within our young people, and his legacy of equity, equal access, the arts and social justice lives on across the landscape of Detroit's cultural community and far beyond. Martina Arroyo is also a legend, a pivotal figure, both as an extraordinary artist and a dedicated pedagogue. Born in New York's Harlem in 1937, she is admired internationally for her operatic roles, oratorio and recital performances, recordings, teaching, and her commitment to young artist development. She has performed on the world's most prestigious stages, New York's Metropolitan Opera, the Paris Opera, London's Covent Garden, Milan's La Scala, the Vienna State Opera, and the Buenos Aires Teatro Colón. Simply speaking, the name Martina Arroyo is synonymous with music making of the highest caliber. After winning a Met audition in 1958, Miss Arroyo substituted for an ailing Birgit Nilsson in 65 and rolled of Aida, launching a decade-long career there in all major Verdi operas, including Donna Anna, Chio Chio San, Liu, Santuzza, Giaconda, and Elsa. In 2003, she established the Martina Arroyo Foundation, which assists emerging artists in the preparation of complete operatic roles. Sphinx Connect recognizes the importance of not only paying tribute to the cornerstone of Arthur L. Johnson's legacy of social justice and human condition, but also celebrating it through the honoring of today's heroes, including this year's honoree. This evening, Sphinx's founder and the Dean of the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance will lead an inter interactive conversation with our honoree, followed by a Q&A with you, our audiences. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the incomparable Martina Arroyo and Aaron Dworkin. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. We are going to have a lot of fun this evening. Okay, let's go for yes. it. Yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and as I ask some questions, I'll kind of uh, show a number of uh, kind of different photos as Oy. we go through that capture some. And we have some snippets out here that, uh, that you can see. But I thought um, I wanted to kind of cover uh, a number of different areas, and I thought I kind of start, you know, in many ways at the at the beginning, and and you going go that that far right? back, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if that's okay. Uh, growing up in Harlem, mm -hmm. uh, and what what was that like, and uh, uh, and what you know, kind of initially were the points of your inspiration? Well, growing up in Harlem was growing up like you would any place, but it was special because I had special parents. I had a wonderful family, and they nurtured all of us in the family. 
And um, it was a rough period in history in a way, but when you have a lot of love around you and when you can respond to love, uh, you, you come through it and you come through it healthfully. Gotcha, gotcha. And what, um, when you kind of, you know, went on and had in, uh, an experience at Hunter College uh, and kind of a beginning to study voice and all that, can you kind of tell us how, what was, how was that impactful for you? Well, first of all, I didn't start at Hunter College. I started at Hunter College High School. Yeah. And I was caught one day making fun of the singers who were um, rehearsing. And Big Mouth naturally got caught and had to sing for the director as a, a punishment. And instead, he said, do you want to be an opera singer? And I said, no. I'm going to be a school teacher. Because I grew up in a home where you, you were doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, a school teacher. And he pushed and pushed and sent me to a teacher, voice teacher, and uh, music took over my life, but in such a positive way that I, I, I didn't give up teaching, because I'm still going back to it right now. But um, I just love singing, and I love singing for people, and I like when they, when they like what I do. So it took over. What do you think? Is the nature in singing or the aspect of singing that enables that impact? What, what, what makes it special? First of all, you're sharing, you're giving, and you're receiving at the same time. You, th you think that you're growing inside as well and spiritually. And I came from a somewhat religious family. I'm not going to try to make it sound bigger than it was, but I did sing in the choir at church for a thousand years. <laughs> not that many, just a thousand. <laughs> but it meant being with other people, with other talented people who shared. Uh, my brother was in the minister of that church, which meant I could, I could go out with boys for a long time. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> but. Um, it allowed me to know that, that I love to sing. And it was as simple as that. I just love to sing. And I love to hear young people sing. There's nothing more wonderful than here going to a school and somebody will get up and sing for you and, and share that love. Um, so that was it. Awesome. Very simple. Awesome. So this is just a little brief video that Oy. I wanted to share. OK. Martina Arroyo's parents told her she could be and do anything. That was until she said that she wanted to be an opera singer. <laughs> her father, perhaps not fully appreciating the versatility required of an opera singer, said he didn't want his daughter to be like a can-can girl. I had great legs, though. In her neighborhood back then, <laughs> opera was not the obvious career path. And there weren't a lot of opera singers who looked like her that she could look up to. But Martina had a dream she couldn't shake, so she auditioned relentlessly and jumped at any role she could get. Along the way, she earned money by teaching and working as a social worker in New York City. And when she got a call from the Metropolitan Opera asking her to fill in the lead for Aida, she was sure it was just a friend pulling her leg. It wasn't until they called back that she realized the request was real. And she just about fell over in shock. But in that breakout role, she won fans around the world, beloved for her tremendous voice and unparalleled grace. Martina has sung the great roles. Mozart's Donna Anna, Puccini's Madame Butterfly, Verdi's Lady Macbeth, and of course, Aida. She's played the world's stages from Cincinnati to Paris to Israel. She's broken through barriers broadening our notion of what magnificent artists look like and where they come from. And along the way, she's helped people of all ages, all over the world, discover the art form that she loves so deeply. For a lot of folks, it was Martina Arroyo who helped them see and hear and love the beauty and power of opera. And with her charitable foundation, she is nurturing the next generation of performers, smart, talented, driven, and joyous, just like her for moving us with the power of her voice and empowering others to share theirs too. We honor Martina Arroyo.
I've lost weight since. So I figured instead of sharing those things, I would let our former president, uh, uh, who does it far more eloquently than, than I ever could. I don't think so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, he mentioned and he referenced about kind of people you might look up to and how in some ways there was a, you know, a lack of, of those leaders, um, especially of color um, uh, in the field. Who do you look up to? Um, and why? Who inspires you? Well, many people. You don't get total um, uh, response from everybody, but when you do hear and speak with people that care about young people and about the growth of young people, it's not difficult to look up to them. We have some great people in our society leading today, but we also have some people that need to have their butts kicked. Um, we can do that later. <laughs> There's no such thing as a perfect situation. We all have to work very hard to get where we, we want to go. And it's not easy. It's an expensive type of a career. It's, it requires a great deal of work and dedication. And there are wonderful people out there who will help us when we need the help. And sometimes you have to tow it alone. But you have to go for what you want. You have to ha have the desire and the ability to fight. And when it's time to fight, we must fight. I'm not referring to anyone. <laughs> uh, but I'm not, here, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to try to start any problems. I'm saying you have to get out, do for yourself, make yourself be qualified so that you can do it. It means extra work, hard work, but do it because it's worth it. You're leading other young people. You try to grow down the path where they can then follow and have lives that we can be proud of. And if there's something in the way, step on it. <laughs> and along those lines, you know, if a young person came up to you and said, you know, with everything I see going on and just um, I feel uh, insecure, I feel no, frustrated. No, you can't feel those things. You've got to feel how I can get there, open the path for others, lead in getting there when it's possible, and keep going. You don't stop. I mean that. Yeah. You I'm did so it. <laughs> Keep trying. Keep trying. That's I do. You gotta do. Uh, so um, you had the opportunity to spend some time in Europe. Lots um, of time. Yes. Can you could you share with us kind of that experience and also was um, aspects of prejudice or racism, was it different there? Um, did and you find challenges? Intolerance is the same all over. Intolerance, um, you know, the, the difference perhaps if you want to call it a difference in Europe, I was a novelty 50 years ago and people like novelties. But the fact is when you get on that stage, you've got to live up to it and you've got to be ready. And that's uh, said to everybody, who wants to get out in front of the public and say, I have a talent and I want to share it with you. You have to work for it. When you get out there, you have to show it and you have to share it with all your heart. And when you see someone coming along who's trying to do the same thing, grab their hand and take them along with you because it's not easy alone. But if, you've got, if you're holding on to somebody who's done it or who is trying to do it, let them know that they have a friend and they have someone who understands. And really work. Work at keeping them alive, work at keeping them healthy, mentally as well as... Um, uh, if and when someone comes along who tries to discourage or who is not helping, don't let them get in your way. You keep moving ahead and it'll be all right. And I'm not a very religious person, but I do believe in the Holy Trinity. And I do believe that there's something about 
sharing that helps us all come closer to something more beautiful than just living and having success, financial success especially. That's not the only thing that's meaningful. Oh. <laughs> So I think I to get a, a sense of, um, you know, a number of young artists who participate in Sphinx. They have yes. these moments in their life when certain things do happen that are incredible. Um, incredibly good or incredibly harmful? Yes, when things good okay. happen. Uh, so you this is a positive. Moved. Yeah, so this is a positive question. Okay. Uh, so um, when you kind of landed the position at the Zurich Opera, can you share with us how that felt? And You're in heaven. You're doing what you want to do. You're working with people that are, are, are like you. And you have to fight and work together. And fight doesn't always, it's not always negative. Fight can be very positive and, and very helpful. And you, but they're doing the same, this running the same road. You hold on to each other and go. <laughs> so I had... Uh, Another little video uh -oh. clip I just wanted to show. Martina Arroyo's legacy in the opera world is indelible. From Verdi to Mozart, her soaring voice transported listeners to other worlds and took Martina around the globe to all the great opera houses. What impression did the different great opera, opera houses oh, of the world leave on you? Well, first of all, when you go to a place like Vienna, uh, London, Covent Garden, or, or to Buenos Aires, the Teatro Colón, you realize that this is a tradition, a tradition that's been going on for a very long time. It's a major part of their cultural activities. It isn't so much in the United States, but there's no opera house that I prefer than the Metropolitan Opera. I nearly wore that top lesson tonight. <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't. <laughs> I'll wear it tomorrow, though. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Whitten was great with his uh, with his questions. Can you tell us about that first performance at the Met? and just what it meant and kind of where, it, where you felt it brought you as an artist. Oh, first of all, talking about it today, 100 years later, I can still feel what I felt that night. And you'll have many times in your life when you will feel again and again uh, those, that, those feelings that made you say, I've got to do this and I love doing this, and I want to share it with somebody, and I want the audience to like me as well, to, to like what I'm doing. But um, there's nothing more inspiring than, and I'm finding this out in these last years only, like watching someone you've worked with get up on that stage and do it well, do it better than you. If, you know, and it's, it's just this, a feeling you can't describe. You know what I'm talking about. When you see them come along and, and move ahead and move ahead with great um, determination and, and have wonderful success or not, you just sometimes you just have to keep fighting until it happens. It doesn't happen always and right away. But it's that I find I love more than having performed myself. You know, that, that, that remains what you're about. What do you say to you know the young artists who may be at that point where they feel they've been fighting and and that moment hasn't happened yet? Take my hand. So the life of a performing artist. Oy. <laughs> There's all of the glamour and the accolades and that feeling from the audience. There's but all that work too. You're right. Oh yeah. And the travel and being on the road. 
can you speak to that and kind of uh, how how did you kind of balance that and did you like kind of that that time on the road and, and I didn't how like did you the time on the road when I was away from my family but because I had a family that said we're taking your hand uh, it was easier to, to bear and I also had a wonderful husband who was as crazy as the day was long he's no longer with us but he was always there to say I didn't think you sang so well tonight <laughs> he, there was always a truth that allowed you to know that you had to go further. And a mother who, and father who were there to say, no matter what happens, we love you. And sometimes they had to say it loud and clear. Uh, but I think you, as you go along in life, you, you, you seek out also those things that are gonna help. And then you realize how important it is that you help the next one. It's, it's all about intertwining and, and, and the growing together and, and this business about jealousy in our profession, there's nothing more beautiful than hear someone do something so well that you love it more than they do. Uh, you, you, you grow. You grow together and you grow and you're giving everything you can to your pub the public, your public. And let's not leave out the importance of not religion as a subject, but as a truth of always caring enough that you realize you're not the only one going through this and all of us need someone else's hand at some point. And you have to be there, you don't have to be, I don't mean over religious, I mean just another human being to be there and know that they can share that with you and you can share that with them. And if it sounds a little bit goody-goody, I promise you that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> vein of, of the way in which we engage with others, not just kind of in our social or familial okay. lives, what about our artistic life? Is there an artistic collaborator or partner that for you has really stood out and or... Many. Many. There's no one. There are many that get you through those performances, uh, that get you to love what you're doing and love it with you, to share it with you. Um, if you close out people out of your life, you know, your hand is closed, you're not gonna get anything. But if you open up and receive what people are willing to give, and I do believe that 99% are willing to share and give. The one or two that get past that, well, give them time, they'll learn. Another video. Uh-oh. <laughs> Which might lead to some more tough, tough questions. If they don't want to hear me sing because of my color, then get somebody else. That is your problem. You're the one missing my voice. On the other hand, if you do like me, I'll give you my best. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> you understood that? <laughs> okay. Thinking about, um, uh, especially being here at, at, at Sphinx, but thinking about the racial um, uh, impact or things that occurred related to race in your career, in your life. Um, I wanted to kind of talk a little about that and just um, were there key poignant times that occurred? Um, and uh, you're a fighter. And, and how did you address some of the more poignant? I kept singing my part. And if they had a problem, let them have the problem. I'm not gonna let that affect my work. And I'm not saying that my work was always the best. I had problems like pe other people and there were nights when the performances weren't as good as they should have been. But I'm not gonna let somebody destroy what I'm trying to build because they've got a problem. You cannot do that. You've got to go ahead. You've got to, you've got to look positively. You've got to give as much as you can so that you, the audience will get, and you, will get the best experience that that can be. But to, to go, in, get, go get in the mire with them is crazy. You know, and then you have to admire other people and see what other people are doing that contributes to what you're doing. Rather than be neg negative, be positive. 
Was there ever a point where an opportunity you wanted or that you felt you deserved? Um, and I didn't get? Lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I wanted to do a particular role and someone else got it, but when you realize that that other someone else is wonderful and you might not have been able to do it that well, you just learn from it and go on to the next time. Guys, this is your one chance. It's our one chance. It's our sh one chance to share and grow ourselves and to help others come along to hold hands. And, and I'm very serious about this, I'm very serious about it. You've got to hold hands and go forward together. You cannot think that your talent is better than someone else's. You have to stand there and say, Miss Bunbury, take that aria on because you can sing. You've got to say, Miss Nielsen, nobody can sing that tour and don't like you, even if you have to sing it the next day yourself. That's not the point. You have to grow. You've got to um, take the best from every situation that you can. Now, it's, you don't always do it because we're human. And sometimes I go home and want to kick myself. And I go back to a colleague and say, I'm sorry. You know, what, what you, this, you, got to have, you have to look forward. You have to look up. And you have to say, is there somebody I can help? Because somebody helped you. Do you think racial... Oh, you're not showing that picture. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh that's terrible. <laughs> I will move on to the next one. <laughs> you move that picture. I was like, <laughs> is, do you think Racial equity um, has fundamentally changed since, say, the, your early days in Harlem to today. Do you think Probably things have evolved? So. Probably so. I think that they should have. And if we keep doing what we have to do to make it happen, uh, things will happen. You know, I don't look at this career racially. I can look at it vocally. I can look at it as a, as a character. I can look at it as a learning experience, but I can't sit there and worry about somebody knows that I'm black. If you take a good look, you'll see it right away. <laughs> but you just don't have time for that. You've got roles to learn. You've got to get a character on stage. You've got to emote through that character. Where's there time to say, you know, her skin is lighter than mine? Come on. On the other hand, you don't want to take a lot of scuff from people who don't deserve it either. I didn't say walk all over me. I just, I think what you shared is just very, very profound, very profound. The, um, I have another video. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, had some questions just related to how much you care about those who are following in your footsteps. Oh, I care a lot about that. <laughs> They're warming up to do a little Don Giovanni. Students in an opera workshop learning all the ins and outs of the Mozart classic. The workshop's called Prelude to Performance, presented by the Martina Arroyo Foundation. The now retired soprano and native New Yorker was one of the top opera singers of her era. Now she helps guide young performers with lessons like when not to sing. And I think we're beginning to learn that now. <laughs> I hope, because you can sing, you can over sing. You can sing, get your voice tired. I've learned more about what it takes to succeed in the professional mm -hmm. opera world uh, at this program than I, I, I have in the That's an expressive face. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a great, she's a great gal too. Can you share with us What's kind of the most important aspect of the work of your foundation? And well, we don't teach voice. So many people say that young people study voice. We teach character so that you know what character you're playing and how that character develops, how that character rela relates to other characters. So it's really very hard because you ha it's not easy. It's not just getting up and singing. It's getting up and going into the life of that person, which means you've got to know it. That's extra work. That's more than just sounding beautiful. That's sound, saying something with your words. That's, that's making that character live and beautifully. 
um, show it's a, kids come into our, young people come into our workshop thinking that being a good singer is enough. But if I don't know who you are as a character, I don't care how well you sing, I'm, say, I'm getting nothing, no message. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I must say the young people have come in and just lightened up my life and I hope that they receive something from us. The, 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 the issue is to become that character by learning who he or she is, by learning he, where he or she comes from. They have to read the history of the era. They have to know what kind of lives they have. Did they have a good mother? Don't think it doesn't affect how you sing. And don't think it doesn't affect how you express um, what you're saying. You, and you must know what every word means. <laughs> you don't see that easy either, either. Those young people work very, very hard and still must have the voices to, to, to sustain it. What do you say to, you know, there are those, unfortunately, that some young people hear today where they say, oh, you know, math, science, you know, the arts are kind of this frilly stuff that should, uh, is not as deserving of time, attention, and resources as some of these other things. What do you say to people? I, say, I don't say anything to them. I ask them to experience enjoying and becoming a part of, of an evening that, well, of young artists, and see what you get from it, what you in turn have to also give to it so that there's, there's an exchange. Uh, I don't go around saying, you know, we're the greatest because we can sing. That, that is, a, if you can't say who you are and express who you are, being able to sing is not enough. But I'm not gonna go around and ask people to do their jobs and expressing your character is a part of your job. But, and I don't also mean to sound hard about it. On the contrary, we, we've cried together to make something work. We've laughed together, but we've, we've always stayed, kept the character alive, hopefully. And what a difference when you see that person become that character. <gasps> I mean, it's unbelievable. What do you think about the opera world, where it is today, where it's heading? Where, where it's heaven? Where, it, where it's heading. Oh, I'd where rather talk about heaven, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that, too. Okay. Um, I don't know where it is. I think those opinions that cover lots of information, that covers knowing 2% of, of the profession but giving 90% of your opinion, it's just that. Uh, you have, the artist, you have to take it where it needs to go, where you can take it, where you can give as much as you can, whatever that is. And you don't always give the same amount, nor do you always get the same amount, but you always work for it. You work as, you make that character live. Um, and I must say, once the young people start working that way, that we can't keep them away from working. Yeah. They, they get right into it and they come in and show you what you should have learned <laughs> years ago. But I don't sit back and criticize the ones who haven't done it yet. This is a very expensive career. There's some wonderful talents who cannot take all the lessons you need to take and advice that you need to take and can sometimes give. But to be deprived of it because of something stupid like your color or because you, there's no money available and you don't try to provide it. That's, that's what's dangerous. You have, to, you have to do as much as you can so that the young artist can move ahead. I think Martina's legacy is, is this passion she had for her profession. She's giving to all these young people right now. She's just one of those people who gets everybody to really feel that the things that matter in music matter to everybody. I think she should not be shut up in the Smithsonian, but she is certainly a national treasure. She's a great actress. So it's really been a tremendous honor, and I want to be able to give uh, the audience an opportunity to ask some questions as well. Thank you. And um, as you know, this honor is, uh, is in the legacy of Arthur Johnson. And um, before uh, he passed, I had the opportunity to 
uh, interview him, and, and I asked him this question and uh, wanted to share with you his response and, uh, and then ask the same question of you. And uh, I asked him, uh, Dr. Johnson, what has been the single most important factor that has enabled you to live the life you have led? What did he say? Never be satisfied with simply doing what is required. Do more than what is required. The path to greatness is a path made in, in, by those who are willing to do more than what is required. And so thinking about his poignant comment on that, Martina Arroyo, you sit here as one of the most accomplished vocalists in the world, celebrated at the Kennedy Center, honors awarded the National Opera, honors award from the NEA, truly a shining example of everything we hope to recognize in honoring this legacy of advocacy for the arts and its impact on social justice. What has been the single most important factor that has enabled you to live such an extraordinary life? Meeting people like you, because no one does it alone. And when I first met you and realized what your organization was about, I thought, I, I like that. I, I want to do something, too, to add on to the things that he's done and what others have done. Uh, we don't do it alone. We do it as a group. And when someone says, makes remarks like that, I, I realized that I wish I had said that. Um, but you, you, you aspire to that because you're, what you're doing is the same thing in another city uh, in another way. And I appreciate that and thank you for that very much. Oh, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Uh, sit down. <laughs> Good morning. So I believe we have a couple of microphones, uh, and so there's microphones, there is, hey. we'll let one uh, initial you. question come from without, and uh, would you like to introduce yourself first, young man, and then you can, and then everyone can line up to the microphone, speak very loudly since you don't have a microphone right there. Your name? Uh, your last name? Yes, <laughs> our son. Our son. <laughs> Little stinker, you got to talk first, too. <laughs> what do you want to ask? Um, so, what do you think about the fact that the Republican Party has been so successful? Sometimes. Sometimes you walk across, sometimes you slip back, and you have to get up and go again. Um, what it is in its experience, an experience that says that. You can. You must make it. I must do this. I must what I need, do what I need to do. And then you go out and do as much as you can. Fight as hard as you can. Oh, I do believe in a good fight. And be ready. When the time comes, know your music. Know how you want to sing it, how you want to say it. Who are you? And give me your best all the time. Okay? Great. You agree or not? <laughs> okay, that was smart. <laughs> <laughs> Very smart. <laughs> yes, a question over here. Hello, Miss Arroyo. My name is uh, John from L.A. Hi, John. Of, of all the great roles you've interpreted, and there's, there's been so many, is there one role that got away that you wish you had done? Norma. Uh. But I did get to sing Lady Macbeth, and that's a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over here. Yes? Hello? Okay. <laughs> um, my question for you is that um, um, have you always like um, loved music from the very beginning or was it something that you kind of slowly got into 
you can see an artist working there? Well, when I was a little girl, I was the ballet dance, but I became the biggest girl in the class. And we thought maybe it's time to <laughs> do something else. Uh, <laughs> but I love uh, body movement. I, I still like dancing very much, and I, I think that the use of the body in the opera is so important that if you have that um, that intention, that that to go go look, investigate and see what you can do with you to keep your body in good shape. And okay. sorry. Um, but there's been nothing, I, I think if you want to do something badly enough, you work to get it done. Maybe not completely, but you can go for it. Don't stand back and use it in, uh, an excuse, as I can't. That's no excuse. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, my name is Hi. Beatrice Thompson. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. And mm -hmm. this is my first time here and even knowing about this organization, which I think is dope. Um, <laughs> it's what? It's dope. It's sweet. Awesome. I think it's Oh, awesome. sorry. I'm a little old. As <laughs> <laughs> Can you say something I, okay. a little older? <laughs> I am in absolute awe of this organization. Yes. And you're the right. empowerment it brings within all of us as we share. Yes. One thing is I've met a lot of instrumentalists, and I know it's for instrumentalists, but it's also inclusive in different ways. I haven't met that many vocalists yeah. here. Hey, well, girl. get some more. <laughs> Hi. And I thank you for, hey, what's up? Hey. All right, we'll talk. And who are you talking to? <laughs> over there. Like, oh, OK. And I think it's important to just add that in there, because like, it's hard for classical vocalists who are African American, as you know, and I just love everything about you just sharing that. And also, can we also, I know there's classical, there is classical hands down, but to people who, I guess, originally started in the classical world who are not conventionally whatever, they think that jazz is like classical to them. It is. Sense. It so is. It's like it's like a hood classical, I guess, if you will, but it's classical to someone else. So can we have an element of that? Because I hear a lot of like I sing classical but I sing jazz and it's just like yeah, yeah. it's theory both sides. Absolutely. And you're involved with the character, you're involved with the words, you're giving a message. Uh, you all haven't heard of the modern jazz quartet. It's old, but it was there a it long was. time ago. And I like Mars, and I, li I put, listen to all kinds of singers, and, and, and it just enriches your life. Why should you cut it out? Yeah. But include it. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm just all asking. Right. Can we do that? Right. Yes. Thank you. You must. Thank, thank you. You must yes. do that. Hi, my name is Matthew. Um, I just wanted to know if I could get a picture with you after this. <laughs> I'm a little old for you, but I'd like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Over here, yes. Good evening, Maestro. Arroyo. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be with you this evening. My name is James Rose, and I mm -hmm. honor Aaron and Afa for this great event yes. uh, coming out of your dreamscape and making it real. I have two questions. Yes. The first question is, you came up through the uh, golden age of opera, really. And I don't know. I think Renee Fleming would say, this is the golden age of opera. <laughs> I, I think she would as well. Yeah. Rudy Bing, of course, was your director. Yes. And he was famous uh, for a lot of things. But what was most interesting for me was that you know, he opened up the pathways of the opera to people of color. And I'd like for you to give that uh, experience of him as a director and the changes that he fostered in a majority He fought for very hard, and he didn't always have people working with him. But he had to be very careful that when he chose someone, there's not going to be a lot of discussion and argument about it, that there was a good chance that person would win over the audience. But I'll tell you, he wasn't very popular when he gave me Elsa in Lohengrin. They had lots of letters, and I had lots of letters, but he said, go out and do it. Just don't fail. <laughs> yeah. 
he lets you know that you have a responsibility and you have your job to do. He's not just letting you go out because you're black. Don't yeah. think it's not given to you. You still have to fight. You still have to work hard. But you have to do that if you were pink and blue. You know, it's, it's just not something that becomes your issue. You, gotta, you still have to work for the best that you can be with the best that you have. My second question. Yes. Uh, you sang uh, with many great colleagues. Uh, are there some that are particularly memorable for you? Oh, there are so many. We only have one evening. <laughs> I, I need another night to get through that group. Um, I, the, my oldest colleagues were people like uh, Cheryl Mills and Placido Domingo. We came along together. But by that same token, singing with a John Vickers was heaven. Singing with, um, oh my gosh, you can go down the list and, and just don't, and they, they were such glorious singers and people. And that's what really, you, what, what you take home with you, the, the, that personality, that what that person gave. And there are more wonderful ones than ones that just had a big name because they were pretty or whatever. Um, the, the, it's a wonderful profession. You get back more than you give. So it means you have a responsibility to give as much as you can. Thank you very much. You're very Thank welcome. you. And we'll probably, I think, just be able to have time for these last three questions. So we'll go here first. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Falwell. Hello. And I had, I had just one question. So uh, my parents have always taught me that your legacy is not just what you establish and what you leave in your wake, but it's also what you strive to accomplish and what you're still looking toward in the future. Um, and I mean, you've had an incredible legacy, many experiences. I'm curious to know, are there still things that you're striving to learn? Are there still questions that you still have? Every is there a future day. that you're starting to see? Oh, every day, every, there's always something new, new. There's also always something you have to give to someone else. There's always something you're getting from someone. Don't forget, if you don't do like this, you don't get what you don't give. Um, the, every day there's something that makes me say, my God, I, I miss that. What a pity. Or there's every day that I say, yeah, she did that well. I want to do it a little bit more like the way she does it rather than the way I do it. Because I learned something from her, whoever it is. It, it's, it's, it's just, it's continuous. It's a continual learning process. And it's a continual giving process as well as receiving. You have to be involved. And that sounds a little bit, you know, sometimes I hear us say things and I think, Jesus, couldn't you put that in some other way or not always sound like you're, you're talking from the highs of heaven. No, I'm talking about life. I'm talking about everyday living, everyday learning, everyday performing, everyday being involved with other people. It's, it's continuous and it's always wonderful. I, I haven't been disappointed yet. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes. Hi, Ms. Arroyo, my name is Morgan Beckford and I'm from oh, Memphis, Morgan. Tennessee. Hey. Hey, I'm actually a vocalist also, and I work with young students with Opera cool. Memphis and run a summer conservatory with okay, them. Okay, great. And um, I really, really strive in my work to let them know that this is an art form that isn't something that's unrelatable and far away and something they don't understand because it's human emotion and it's very tactile and very real. And I wanted to know if there was a moment when you were young, I mean, beyond the singing in the choir and realizing that this, this, that you like this art form, but was there a moment that you knew that this is what you had to do? Every day of my life. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank there you. There was a third person. Our last question, yes. Um, you've done, a, I can see that you've done a lot of roles um, with the operas. Um, I was just wondering, how do you, um, uh, get into character with these roles? Like, how do you transition, especially, like, if you have back-to-back -back performances with different roles? How do you transition and get into those characters? Well, um, you know, we're talking after a long time. In the beginning, it's a little bit different when you have to get into a character. You have to know what that character is, that you, where you want to go. But even now, you still have to question the truth of that character and what the truth is for you. And you ha have colleagues who bring in the, how they feel about it, but 
you must, there must be a truth there, because if it's not, the audience knows immediately. The audience recognizes immediately when you're lying. And sometimes you must lie because of something like you're sick or something like that, but you have had enough experience to draw from your previous experiences to make it work. Other, but you can't, you can't go in, you can't lie to the audience. You really can't. They'll get you every time. And not the way you necessarily want them to, <laughs> to be caught. Um, and that's why I think the program that we have deals with the character, not with the sound only. They have to come together and you have to find out what that truth is and make that work. Does it always 100%? Well, nothing happens 100%, not even your marriage. Mine did, I'm not talking about me. <laughs> um, well, it, was, it did. <laughs> um, but you have to work all the time. You can't think I know it and therefore I can just phone it in. Which means that you're giving a lot and you're, you're, you're tired. You need to make sure that you're refreshed enough to give again. But you also get a lot. You also, you also are refreshed by your audiences and by your colleagues because they're giving too. Um, but one thing's for sure, you'll be happy when you get it right. Any other questions? No, thank you. So. This has been just an extraordinary time, and I would love to ask Afa to come to stage so that we can formally okay. present uh, you with the Arthur L. Johnson Memorial thank Lecture you. Award. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> for your extraordinary contributions to this art forum, to your community, and to our young people, it is our honor to present you formally with the 2017 Memorial Arthur L. Johnson Award for all of your work. Thank you so much. years ago. So this is real joy. I thank you so much. I hope you will always be the audience that you are, giving and full of love. We can't do it without you. And we expect you to be doing it some of the time. So thank you. And come and say hello to me if you see me in, the, in some other city. I'll remember. I'll even tell you what you wore. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you. Hi. Nice.